So welcome to the 11th session of Mapping Global Populism panel series organized by the European Centre for Populism Studies. Uh, my name is Christo Pretorius and last year I graduated from University College Cork with a Master's in International Public Policy and Diplomacy and I'm currently interning here at ECPS. ECPS curates this panel series aimed at dissecting the diverse manifestation of populism across the world. Following the successful conclusion of our Mapping European Populism panels, we've embarked on a journey to explore populism beyond the confines of Europe by expanding our panel series to encompass a global perspective aptly titled Mapping Global Populism. Our objective is to construct a comprehensive understanding of populism worldwide, featuring monthly sessions. Today we will have our 11th session of the Mapping Global Populism panel series. This session will examine populist authoritarianism in China, national and global perspectives. As a testament to our commitment to knowledge dissemination, we are going to write a panel report and share the video recording of this panel on the website and YouTube channel. These resources serve as invaluable references for scholars, policymakers, and a wider audience concerned about contemporary challenges to global democracy posed by populism and authoritarian politics. In the ongoing journey of our panel series, we extend our gratitude to all the scholars and experts who contribute their extensive insights. And with this, we introduce our esteemed moderator and distinguished panelists for today's enlightening discussion. Today, our panel is going to be moderated by Dr. John Nielsen Wright, Associate Professor in Jap uh, Modern Japanese Politics and International Relations at the University of Cambridge. In addition to his positions at Cambridge, Dr. Nielsen Wright has been Senior Research Fellow for the Northeastern, Northeast Asia and Korea Foundation, Fellow at the Asia Program at Chatham House, of which he previously directed as Head of Program from March 2014 to October 2016, and has been the Monbushu Research Fellow at Kyoto and Tokyo Universities, and a visiting fellow at Tohoku University, Yonsei University, Korea University, and Seoul National University. He has also been a member of the World Economic Forum, Global Agenda Council on Korea, and UK Korea Forum for the Future. He is director of the UK Japan 21st Century Group. In 2014, he was recipient of the Narcosone Yoshihiro Prize. Dr. Nilsson Wright's recent work has con uh, continued to concentrate on Cold War relationship between the United States and Northeast Asia, with particular reference to security and political relationships between the United States and Japan and the two Koreas, but has expanded to include contemporary regional security issues and political change. Dr. Yosef Yi will be our first speaker, presenting on the topic of discourse regimes and liberal venements. Dr. Yi is Associate Professor of Political Science at Hanyang University in Seoul, and he earned his BA from UC Berkeley and his PhD in Political Science from the University of Chicago. Dr. Yi's research focus on diverse, uh, diversity, so civil society, and liberal democracy, particularly in North America and East Asia. In 2016, he was selected as one of the top 23 excellent researchers at Hanyang University, one of only two professors from social sciences. Dr. Meredith Shaw will be our second speaker, discussing foreign threat perceptions in South Korean campaign discourse, Japan, North Korea, and China. Dr. Shaw is an associate professor in the Institute of Social Sciences at the University of Tokyo and managing editor at the social Sci of the Social Science Japan Journal. Her work, which has been supported by grants from Fulbright Foundation and the Korea Foundation, examines cultural policies and state efforts to manipulate culture in East Asia. Her research has been published in the Journal of Conflict Resolution, the Pacific Review, and the Journal of East Asian Studies, and she has also written for the National Interest, Global Asia, and the Diplomat. Dr. Shaw has worked for several years as a research assistant and translator at the Korea Institute for National Unification before obtaining her PhD in political science and international relations from the University of Southern California. She was 2019 Korea US Next Gen Scholar and is in the inaugural cohort of the Mansfield Lucas uh, Asia Scholars Network. Our third speaker is Dr. San Jin Han, who is Professor Emeritus at the Department of Sociology at Seoul National University. His research often relies on survey data and focuses on social theory, political sociology, human rights, and transnational justice, middle-class politics, participatory risk governance, Confucianism, and East Asia development. After his retirement, he has given lectures as a distinguished visiting professor at Peking University, China. He has lectured as a visiting professor at various higher institutes, such as Columbia University in New York, the School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris, France, the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, and Kyoto University in Japan. Dr. Han will deliver his presentation entitled Transformation of Populist Emotion in Korea Politics from 2016 to 2024. Dr. Zhu Yong Li will be our fourth speaker, presenting on the topic of nationalism um, and resilience of authoritarian rule in North Korea. 
Dr. Lee is a research professor in the School of International Relations at the University of Ulsan, uh, specializing in comparative authoritarianism in uh, North Korean politics and post-communist regimes in East Asia. He earned his PhD from University College Dublin. The panel's last presentation, titled Populist Nationalism as a Challenge to Democratic Stability in Mongolia, will be delivered by Dr. Mina Sumandi, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the School of International Studies at Shuyan University. Dr. Sumandi is also a senior researcher at the Sant Morel Foundation, one of the leading polling institutions in Mongolia. During her time at the foundation, she worked on numerous national and cross-national surveys, including Gallup World Poll and the World Justice Project. Her major research interests are democratization, Chinese and Russian foreign policies, um, research methodologies, and international development. As a reminder, we do do a Q&A session after the completion of the presentations, and our respective participants can write down their questions in the chat box or by raising their virtual hand and post the questions in person. You can find the button at the bottom of the screen. Now I leave you with Dr. John Nielsen Wright, who will present an overall view on populism in the covered countries and administer the panel. Thank you. Risto, thank you very much. And let me start by saying what a pleasure it is to be here for this very important discussion about the questions of populism and authoritarianism in Northeast Asia. Um, I thought for my introductory remarks, what I might do is, is talk both about South Korea and North Korea. I'm not a Mongolia specialist, so forgive me if I uh, don't address that issue directly. I know this will be covered very ably by our, uh, our designated speaker. Um, so looking at South Korea, um, at first glance, one might argue that it might be questionable whether in fact populism is really relevant in thinking about South Korea in terms of the country's success, in terms of its economic development, its growing international profile. If we think back to a few years ago when it was invited to the G7 summit in Cornwall, um, participation at the late latest Hiroshima summit, um, South Korea seems to be a vibrant, successful democratic state. Um, and as we know all too well, with the April elections looming on the horizon, uh, the political process seems to be healthy and vigorous. Um, and it was, of course, only a few years ago, the famous candlelight demonstrations that brought together tens, if not hundreds of thousands of South Koreans to demonstrate against the government of Park Geun-hye, this seemed to be a very affirmative declaration of the strength of the political culture of South Korea. Its uh, democracy is a consolidated democracy. And in terms of its institutional frameworks, South Korea, again, seems to be um, a primary example of the success of democratic governance. Um, regular national assembly elections, a presidential system of regular appointments, one-year presidencies, a written constitution, uh, a, a very systematic and well-documented process of judicial review, a diverse and flourishing media culture, a vibrant civil society represented by labor unions, NGOs, uh, and religious organizations. Um, and as those candlelight demonstrations so amply demonstrated, vigorous public engagement in the political process. But there are limitations. Um, Organizations like Freedom House and others have pointed that in pointed out the simple fact that in terms of press freedom, South Korea ranks relatively low by comparison with other countries, 60th out of 180 countries, according to some recent surveys. And Andrew Yeo of the Brookings Institution has made the point that despite all the very significant political progress South Korea has made since the transition from authoritarian to democratic governance in the late 1980s, it is not yet, in, in Andrew Yeo's words, um, a member of the advanced upper tier of advanced democracies. Uh, in fact, some critics, more extreme critics, would argue that South Korea is in danger of democratic backsliding. Ji Wook Shin, a sociologist based at Stanford University, has argued somewhat controversially that South Korea is in the midst of a democratic depression, pointing to uh, polarization between left and right, a tendency for the discourse of politics to focus on demonization of political opponents, um, a tendency for the political system to exhibit signs of political decay, a type of pathology in the words of my Cambridge colleague, John Dunn, um, and a strong sense of anti-elitism and a profound sense of anger and distrust between the two opposing sides of the political spectrum. 
In all of this, one of the key animating features of populist politics, the debate over who constitutes the people uh, in a given polity, seems to be very much underscored by the debate in South Korea between those people who point to the so-called miracle on the Han River, one very distinctive narrative of economic exceptionalism, and others who celebrate the achievements of democratic transition that emerged through the 60s, 70s, and 80s in South Korea. Bringing those two sides together is arguably very, very difficult. In contrast, Eric Mobrand, a young scholar at Seoul National University, has pointed to the very civic activism of the South Korean public as a sign that the country still remains relatively economically and politically healthy. Uh, and of course, there have been um, very powerful examples where the institutions of government have worked in a way that have supported the political process. Think back to the 2004 impeachment attempt against then President No Mu Hyun. The guardrails of democracy, to quote Stephen Levitsky, worked to protect the president against what was seen as an overreach on the part of political partisans. Um, and if you look at the, the overall historical evolution of South Korea from a system of what I think it's probably fair to say was illiberal democracy under the First Republic of Syngman Rhee, through the periods of authoritarian government under uh, Pak Chung Hee, to the 1980s when we had a system of what some people have referred to as democratic paternalism, first under uh, No Tae-yu, then under the two Kims, King, Kim Young-sam and Kim Dae-jung. And finally, since 2002, a more participatory form of democracy, we've seen a steady evolution in the way the political process operates. Um, so what might be the problems that undercut um, and threaten some of the integrity of those institutions? Weak party identification, uh, the dominance of localism in politics, a tendency for party structures to be very hierarchical, an occasional weaponizing of political nostalgia uh, by actors on both the left and the right of the political spe spectrum to delegitimize their political opponents, uh, and a tendency, as I've mentioned already, to engage in narratives of political exceptionalism that are rather zero sum. Some of that may be changing. We see that, for example, in the broader efforts on both the left and the right to commemorate key events in South Korea's political history, particularly the traumatic events of Gwangju and the Jeju uprising in 1948. Um, but I think it's legitimate to ask whether the tendency towards um, participatory and demonstrative politics, street politics, if you like, on both the left and the right of the political spectrum is a sign of institutional weakness in South Korea or the tendency, for example, to use the special prosecutor's office uh, by both political actors on the left and the right to go after their political opponents, um, as we saw both during the presidency of Lee Myung-bak, but more recently under Moon Jae-in and the Cho Book affair. All of this has raised legitimate questions about the um, maturity of the political system. There is a danger that politicians use a binary discourse, a type of Manichaean language in which left and the right are framed in oppositional terms, good versus evil. Um, and we can think of lots of examples on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, however troubling that might be, if we want to perhaps stress a more positive assessment, we could see this as primarily the preserve of elite politics. And if we think back to the last presidential contest, what was so striking was how close the election was and how most of the political discourse in terms of actual mobilizing political actors was in the middle ground, in the center ground, based on questions of economic efficiency, rather than some of these more emotive political issues. But I think it still remains, for the reasons I've outlined, an open question whether, um, whether those institutions will continue to contain the um, polarizing tendencies that I've alluded to. Some of that may be a reflection of internal tensions. Some of it, arguably, may also be amplified by external threats. It's striking, for example, that in the face of the challenge of the DPRK and wider concerns over China, many commentators have referred to the emergence of a new form of nuclear populism. Whether, that, whether populism in this case is the best um, adjective to describe this or not, is another um, debatable question. But I think the shift to the extremes, the fact that 70% of the South Korean population now embraces the idea of acquiring nuclear weapons is a sign of how emotion, 
fear and distrust can fuel a political climate that is deeply uncertain and unpredictable. Let me say a few words about North Korea, and again, as a way of hopefully setting the scene. Obviously, North Korea is not a democracy, despite its uh, official title, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Um, but it's interesting to ask the question, how best can we explain the durability of the North Korean regime? In the past, of course, there were different interpretations. Hannah Arendt famously described the strength of authoritarian regimes in terms of totalitarian, totalitarian control. More recent writers, um, such as Steve Levitsky and Lucan Wei, have argued that in thinking about the durability of authoritarian systems of control, we need to focus on social rather than political change. And this perhaps opens the door to thinking creatively about the links between populism in South Korea and the style of politics in the North. Um, the key sources of uh, political authority in North Korea and other authoritarian regimes, according to Levitsky, are three things a cohesive ruling elite, a highly developed coercive apparatus, and the complete and systematic elimination of all opponents. And we can see plenty of evidence of this in North Korea. The purge of political opponents that took place after Kim Jong-un took power in 2011, particularly the execution of his uncle, Chang Sung Tek. But all of this, however important it is, is only one part of the explanation of why the North has been so successful in hanging on to power. Equally importantly, I would argue, is the role of culture, propaganda, and all of this, emotions. Um, and I think the emotional dimension of politics, whether in an authoritarian or a democratic system, is perhaps an important way in bringing our analysis of the two careers closer together. Um, this emotion is based on partly fear, partly um, what the writer Jonathan Haidt has described as an animating self-righteous predisposition based on a sense of grievance and a profound sense of resentment of one's opponents, um, whether at home or abroad. Um, it's also linked to the tendency to weaponize the past, to engage in campaigns of political nostalgia. And Katie Stallard and others have pointed to the use of political nostalgia in North Korea as a way in which the regime, the current regime, has sought to consolidate its authority. Will this authority last? Um, well, again, I think we're seeing quite deliberate efforts by Kim Jong-un uh, to emphasize the differences between North and South Korea. We saw that, of course, with the rather unprecedented decision to reject the idea of formal unification, breaking with generations of doctrine that defined the leadership in the North under Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. Um, and we've also seen a willingness to use uh, um, questionable mythologized historical motifs, whether it's the symbolism of visits to Mount Pictou um, or the attempt to frame the legitimacy of the leadership in very anti-enlightenment, anti-rational, somewhat romanticized narratives of the past. Um, whether it's organic notions of state one-hearted unities associated with Juche and self-reliance, um, or other themes that are very much closely tied to, to the family dynastic leadership of the North. Will this last? Um, at one level, there is a pressure on the part of the regime for good pragmatic reasons to focus on economic self-interest. Closer ties, of course, with China and Russia reflect that. Uh, but of course, this is happening at a time when China and Russia themselves, under the, under the leaderships of Mao and Putin, are embracing some of that mythologized history and that appeal to emotion that we've seen so often in the past in North Korea. John Gray, in his recent book describing the so-called New Leviathans, points to the emergence of a revitalized sense of uh, Russian Orthodox nationalism uh, under Putin. And in Mao, Mao's China, in, sorry, in Xi Jinping's China, we've seen an effort on the part of the leadership to not only turn the clock back to a re-amplified form of um, nationalism associated with Maoism, but also an attempt to indigenize um, the basis for Chinese leadership. Um, will these emotional determinants become more important uh, in the future? Um, all of this, I think, is an open question. Um, we will have to look closely at the way in which the leadership decides to formulate its key national policy objectives. Um, but all of this is happening at a time when conflict between democracies and authoritarianism 
is actually perhaps providing an added incentive, a destabilizing and disturbing one, to double down on this politics of emotion and grievance in ways that are arguably very unpredictable. Um, I will stop there. Um, and hopefully those uh, framing ideas will give us something to think about and um, return to in the Q&A session. But let me hand over now to Dr. Joseph Yi, Associate Professor of Political Science at Hanyang University, for his presentation entitled Discourse Regimes and Liberal Vehemence. Uh, yeah. Professor Yi, over to you. Thank you, John. Um, so populism is oftentimes linked to its post against uh, pluralism. And, and we think in terms of like painting your opponents as, as enemies of the people, as enemies of liberal democracy. Um, and then also as uh, you're willing to sacrifice the rights of your opponents, you know, these people who are dressed to liberal democracy. Okay, uh, excuse me. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, I'm gonna start the slideshow. Okay, uh, if you can hold on a sec, let me, uh, okay. From the beginning. Okay, does everybody see my slide, right? Okay. Uh, so discourse regimes and liberal vehemence. Okay, so the IR literature predicts cooperation between democracy and animosity between democracies and autocracies. But on the other hand, we see rising animosity, uh, Doyle's vehemence among OECD democratic polities, both at, the, at both the national and subnational level. So at the subnational level, California banned state-funded travel to Florida, and the EU froze Hungary's access to the COVID recovery fund and sued Hungary over the anti-gay law. And then you know, here in South Korea, South Korea has a free trade agreement with China, but not with Japan. Okay. And so my theoretical argument is that democratic polities diverge, both in terms of values and information markets, and this generates mutual animosity as one considers the other to be illiberal dressed to, as, as an illiberal false democracy. And so I distinguish between two sets of norms and rights, procedural norms and rights, such as free speech and objective, uh, objective journalism and pluralism, and substantive rights and norms, such as social justice and equal dignity. And I posit two approaches. One is a positive sum. So this is traditional classical liberalism where procedural rights ultimately support substantive rights. So it's not a zero sum game between procedural and substantive rights. It's a positive sum. They support each other. That open plural discourse contribute to social justice. But recently there's an emerging approach that procedural rights are incompatible with substantive rights. And so you see an emerging victims' rights approach that prioritizes the rights of victimized groups over the speech rights of oppressors. You have both a left-wing version and a right-wing version. So the left-wing version stresses the rights of historically marginalized groups. Right-wing version stresses groups stigmatized by the left today. Uh, and so you have an example with Elon Musk who declared the slogan from the river to the sea that is an euphemism for like genocide. And so it should be banned by Twitter. So that's an example of a right-wing victims discourse. Okay. And then you see examples from Florida, you know, so for example, like Poland's LGBT free zones prioritize the rights of religious conservatives over the free speech of LGBT activists. Uh, Sweden and Finland criminalize uh, like anti-LGBT speech. Okay. My second key variable is information markets. And my claim is that uh, both Mansfield and Snyder argue that newly democratizing states lack an efficient free marketplace of ideas. And I argue that even in mature democracies, victims' rights discourse limit information markets 
by restricting harmful speech. And so in a dominant discourse regime, all major institutions of government, media, schools, reinforce the same rules on public discourse. A non-dominant regime does not. And so I have a two by two table. Uh, so, you know, right wing victim, right, you know, right wing victim rights, left wing victim rights procedural. And if, and if it's uh, non-dominant or dominant. Okay. Uh, okay. And so for example, like, you know, Russia's Putin today and South Korea from like 1950s to 80s, we might consider it kind of a right wing victim rights uh, that, you know, and the question is, you know, since 2017 to 22, was it a left-wing victim rights hegemony? Okay, let's move on. So I have, I have several propositions. One is that one, you see greater animosity among democracies with different discourse regimes. That the governing regimes in one, well, so the proponents of one discourse regime view that of another as tolerating or committing human rights violations. Okay. Um, and then my and then my related argument is that the publics of competing victim VR regimes access different information. And so in the United States, when you listen to left wing or right wing media, you get exposed to a different set of facts. Okay. So if you watch New York Times versus Fox News. And so uh, so for New York Times, for example, like, uh, like, so when you go to Fox News, you see many articles about you know, transgender women molesting children, and it doesn't appear on New York Times. Uh, just one example. Okay. Uh, and then let me move on. But, and then my second proposition is that animosity is especially high when one democracy follows a VR dominant model, victim rights dominant model, that restricts information nationwide and the other country and the other democracy does not. And so again, South Korea in the 1960s to 80s, you had a right-wing regime that repressed pro-communist speech and the Korean CIA kidnapped and almost executed opposition leader for being pro-communist. Okay, on the other hand, since the 2010s, you have, a, you have examples of a left-wing victim regime that prioritize the rights of colonial victims over the academic freedom of dissenting scholars. And so, um, right, so, you know, so for example, like I have students who in my class, one of them went to the DMZ. Uh, and so the dominant discourse is that comfort women were, you know, were abducted, deceived, and tortured by the Japanese military. Okay. And anybody who disputes this dominant narrative are you know, legally prosecuted and sometimes in prison. And so you have a Suncheon National University professor who told his class that some comfort women probably volunteer. Song was fired and sentenced to six months in prison. Likewise, Yonsei professor Yu Suk Chan and Sejun University's Park Yu Ha were also legally prosecuted for things they said in class or, so, or for something they published. Okay, and so uh, and so this kind of uh, this kind of censorship applies not only to the dissenting scholars but also people like me who support their academic freedom. And so I wrote an essay in the Diplomat calling for debating, not censuring Harvard Mark Professor Ramsier for his provocative article. And my essay inspired fifteen hundred students from my university to petition for my termination. And, the, and so the South Korean media describe, characterize both the dissenting academics and those who defended their freedom as different shades of denialism regarding the Japanese military atrocity. So it's not only the dissenting scholars, but also those who support academic freedom who are labeled as denialists. Uh, and, one, and so if you're a denialist, uh, oftentimes activists, is, they're willing to kind of violate procedural norms. And so one of the norms that was violated was you know, reporting the full facts. And so if you come to my university on the second floor, there's a, oh, sorry. <laughs> if you come to my university on the second floor, there is a big, okay, there's a big banner. 
okay, uh, condemning Professor Joseph E. And in English, the student council allegedly quoted from Professor E from one of his lectures that Korean historians are a bunch of nationalist liars. So this sounds like a very def you know, defamatory statement. On the other hand, the full statement, because in my lecture, I was actually quoting uh, best-selling author, Dr. Lee Young-hoon, and the full quote was, Lee Young-hoon says that Korean historians are a bunch of nationalist liars. But the Korean student activists, they just took out the first part. Okay. And then they posted it on the bulletin board and they shared this with entire South Korean media. Okay. Uh, let's moving on. On the other hand, you see more open and plural discourse in Japan. Uh, so the government doesn't criminalize whether left wing or right wing scholarly perspectives on the comfort women. Okay. And a Japanese newspaper actually published my article saying that, you know, Japanese activists should tolerate comfort women statues, should support open and plural discourse. Okay. And so what I find is that restrictions on colonial discourse in South Korea and their absence in Japan generates diverging information markets. Nearly all Koreans believe that the Imperial Japanese military forcibly abducted 200,000 Korean women and girls to be comfort women. And they criticize the Japanese government for denying these abductions. Conversely, most Japanese media, including the left-wing Asahi Shimbun, they, no they no longer report that the Japanese military abducted this woman. They say that, you know, the claim doesn't have any corroboration. It may have happened, but there's no evidence that this actually did happen. And so the bottom line is that the political elites of South Korea and Japan uh, largely frame the other as illiberal. Uh, and so the South Korean elites, especially left-wing governments, uh, they frame the Japanese government as, you know, kind of like supporting the fascist regime in the past. On the other hand, the Japanese government frames the Korean government as supporting censorship. Okay. Just two minutes remaining, if I may. Four. Uh, okay. On the other hand, Taiwan and Philippines do not censor public discourse on the on the on the colonial past, and they share free trade agreements and military exercises with Tokyo. On the other hand, Seoul's leftist governments cooperate more with other governments that also limit pro-Japan speech. And so President Moon declared when visiting China, our two countries endure the travails of imperialism together as we struggle together against Japanese colonialism. So he embraced China, he embraced Japan, uh, North Korea, as uh, supporting like you know, justice against Japan. Okay. And so, so I lead with two questions. One is that if people have access to the same facts, the same information markets, would they be more likely to cooperate and compromise, such as on the 2015 Comfort Women Agreement? And so if we share the same information markets, that you know, these comfort women were you know, treated very terribly, uh, but maybe they were not abducted by the Japanese military, and the Japanese and the comfort women for the Japanese military share similarities with the comfort women for the US military, then would Koreans be more willing to compromise? such as on the 2015 agreement. Okay, and so I'll leave you with that. And then also I wanted to leave you with other examples. Uh, so you see this kind of censorship, not just on comfort women, but on other topics. So recently Disney Plus uh, had a new show called Snowdrop, which, which, fictional, which did a fictional portrayal of a North Korean spy in South Korea's democracy movement. But then many people condemned it saying, how dare you kind of defame the democracy movement? And so in South Korea today, making certain claims about North Korean spies, such as you know, North Korean spies in the Gwangju movement, may lead, may lead to prosecution. And so Ji Man Wan received a two-year prison, two prison, prison sentence for his conspiracy theory claims about North Korean spies in the Gwangju democracy movement. Okay. So anyway, so I conclude by saying that I do see, you know, I do agree with Stanford Professor Shin that, that you know, of strong populist strengths in both the South Korean left and right that portrays 
their opponents as enemies of democracy, as enemies of the people, and enemies of the people do not deserve procedural rights and norms. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Professor Yi, thank you very much. Um, lots of things that I'm sure we'll want to come back to in the Q&A session. And thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, raising really, I think, interesting questions about the nature of historical facts and objective knowledge, the question of what is animating this sense of um, victimization on both the left and the right, how much of that is driven by technical change, um, how much of it is a product of particular historical traumas that resonate powerfully with the different groups that feel a sense of grievance. Um, thank you very much. Let us move on swiftly, if I, we may, to Dr. Meredith Rose Shaw, Associate Professor at the Institute of Social Science, the University of Tokyo, for her presentation entitled Foreign Threat Perceptions in South Korean Campaign Discourse, Japan, North Korea, and China. Dr. Shaw, over to you. Thank you. Let me just try to start my slideshow. Can you hear me? Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you, Joseph, for, for your in your uh, lead in. Um, I'm going to start my remarks today with a challenging contention uh, that given its geopolitical circumstances, South Korea should have already been overtaken by right-wing populism a long time ago. Historically, right-wing populism is often energized by a real or perceived threat from a communist foe and Modern South Korea arguably faces realistic threats from not one, but two single party communist states in its backyard. It also fought a devastating war with both of them in the not so distant past. So consider if you will, what that, oh, sorry, I'm having trouble with my screen. Consider what that means for the progressive left. Every time North Korea test fires a missile or attacks at the DMZ, rightly or wrongly, their domestic support takes a hit. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to pause here and something is wrong with my slide. Um, I wonder if our technical staff can help us. No, it's it's on my end, I think. Um, okay. I just need to close it out and start it up again. Okay. Um, here we go. Uh, sorry. Hmm, it's really not letting me move on. Okay, well, um, here we go. Sorry, um, I'll just move on. So consider what that means for the progressive left. Every time North Korea test fires a missile, their domestic support is gonna take a hit because it's just too easy for their opponents to tar them with guilt by association particularly when the South Korean left has is associated with several past humanitarian uh, initiatives that arguably helped the North Korean re regime. So think about how the left wing in your own countries might struggle if it was saddled with association by such a frequently misbehaving communist neighbor. In international relations, we refer to this as the second image reversed problem, the idea that events in the international arena have consequences for a uh, state's domestic politics. And I posit that South Korean politics are particularly vulnerable to this sort of second image reversed problems. So let me see if I just share my entire desktop, if you can see it. Um, so, so I posit that the fact that North Korea has escaped a populist drift to the right owes to two factors principally. One is the relatively recent memory of a repressive right-wing dictatorship, 
And two is the um, less obvious, but the emotional counterweight of the anti-Japan anti sentiment in South Korea. Now, I don't have time to fully explain this in the 15 minutes that I have allotted, but uh, in short, the right wing in Japan, in Korea is associated with being more pro-Japan than the political left for various historical reasons. And me since memories of the past colonial experience are still very bitter, this has given the progressive left uh, an emotional counterweight to hit back against right-wing anti-communism. In my previous research, I showed that um, politicians on the left tend to use anti-Japan rhetoric in reaction to uh, public scrutiny of their allegedly pro-North Korean policies. And conversely, uh, politicians on the right tend to accuse the left of being pro-communist or chongbuk uh, in response to public scrutiny of their own uh, attitudes toward Japan. So these are sort of dueling antagonisms. And um, so I look at various ways that this plays out in South Korean political discourse. Um, both of these Chinil and Chongbuk labels carry a potential for populist appeal because they imply that the elites on one side or the other do not really have the nation's interests at heart. Um, for instance, in the 2020 general election, there was a really interesting phenomenon where some progressive groups launched this campaign specifically targeting alleged uh, pro-Japan members of the conservative party. And these appeared as protest placards and also on social media. So the slogan here says, the general election is a Korea-Japan battle and it identifies various prominent conservatives as chinilpa that are to be eliminated in the, in the upcoming election. These memes use commonly known imagery uh, associated with Imperial Japan to uh, make every, you know, that Koreans would naturally associate with that. And then there are these more detailed cards that outline the specific grounds for the accusation. Note that um, in this particular case on the right, uh, this individual, the card claims to list his uh, various pro-Japan statements. But when you read it, it's mostly a list of um, basically anti-communist, you know, red baiting remarks. And this only makes sense when you understand that in the South Korean context, red baiting and pro-Japan sentiment are considered to go hand in hand. So then uh, of course there was the backlash by the conservative party and it attempted to turn the tables first by pointing out that actually a lot of uh, leading left wing politicians also have some problematic uh, past relationships with Japan. And then somebody launched a rival campaign mimicking that rhetoric, but saying that the general election is a South-North battle, implying that the real enemy is North Korea. So they're clearly using the same slogan here, the same font, uh, and you know, it, it's a clear case of mimicry, demonstrating that when the right feels targeted on Japan, it specifically pivots toward North Korea a lot of the time. And then right before the election, this is, so this is February, 2020, what happens? Uh, of course, this COVID happens and you see this really interesting phenomenon where these memes get transformed um, into pitching the election now as a Korea-China battle. These were really professionally produced by a conservative activist group. And you can see how they took all the elements of the Korea-Japan battle meme and reconstructed them to fit anti-China talking points. So this happened right before the 2020 election and exit polling in fact showed that anti-China sentiment was unexpectedly strong that year in 2020. Obviously, COVID-19 was a, a surprise spoiler, but also some of that sentiment had been building for quite some time. And anyway, it sort of ruined this uh, uh, whole Japan versus North Korea battle that both parties had been kind of building towards over the past year before, kind of took them by surprise. 
So that brings me to the topic of China and this rising feeling against it among the South Korean public in recent years. And this matters because if we accept this argument that the Korean public emotions are kind of tenuously balanced between these dueling antagonisms of Japan and North Korea, then the next question is, what happens when a new antagonism against China enters the mix? So this survey, I think, it really shows how recent this phenomenon is. For, for years beforehand, um, up until about 2017, it was always a neck and neck competition between Japan and North Korea for the you know most hated neighbor. And China and the US, people generally thought well of both of them. And this is kind of surprising, right? If you think about it, because you know South Korea and China were on opposite sides of a big war and China still considers that to be a war of aggression and China often supports South Korea's enemy, North Korea. But, but up until quite recently uh, in the both the political rhetoric and in the popular culture in South Korea, they didn't really pay a lot of attention to you know driving up anti-China sentiment. They you know, thought China was kind of okay. Um, so this is a pretty new um, recent phenomenon. And so far, the politicians on both sides seem uncertain of how to respond to it. Uh, after all, China is South Korea's biggest trade partner, and neither party wants to get on its bad side. However, you know, public sentiment in this regard has a way of taking over if it's not somehow addressed. So a surge of anti-China sentiment arose again just before the 2022 presidential election. This was a series of controversies uh, related to the Beijing Olympics, but they it, underneath it, there was also, again, uh, anti-China sentiment had been building for a while. And again, this seemed to take the parties by surprise, although both of the leading candidates on the left and right both made anti-China statements shortly before the election. And I felt at the time that this would be an important thing to monitor for the next election. So I started tracking how anti-China sentiment leaks into Korea's uh, political campaign rhetoric. And I found two interesting conclusions so far. And the first one is kind of unsurprisingly that right-wing candidates tend to be more willing to take up the mantle of anti-China sentiment, although reluctantly so far. And two, the language that they use to talk about China does not merely copy their old anti-communist rhetoric towards North Korea. In fact, it more closely resembles the rhetoric traditionally used by the left toward Japan, depicting this big power neighbor that steals Korean culture, distorts history, and encroaches on territory and generally bullies everyone with uh, its military and economic power. So I argue that this has even more potential to disrupt the existing balance because the current anti-China rhetoric does not just overlap and replace the anti-North Korea stuff, uh, but it draws on the sort of sentiments that the other side always used and sets up China to surpass Japan as the pushy, overbearing neighbor role. Now, as it happens, next month, South Korea will go to the polls again. In fact, today marks the official start of the campaign period. So in this last part, if I may, I want to show you just a few things that I'm looking at to measure South Korea's second image reverse problem and some of the international influences on its current campaign rhetoric. So one thing I've been tracking is the evolution of this term sadejui, uh, often translated as flunkyism. It means someone who acts subservient or subordinate to a bigger nation. And this has a long history in Korea. It originally referred to pre-modern Korea's tributary relationship with the Qing, and then uh, later with those who collaborated with Imperial Japan. And then in the post-war, it was used to denigrate the military dictatorship's dependence on the United States. 
So it, it's gone all over and now it's sort of coming back home to China. So more, more recently, I've seen it used by both left and right wing agitators on social media in different contexts, always negatively, um, sometimes referring to Ch Japan, the US, China, and even North Korea during uh, the Moon administration. It's an important concept to track because it hints at which foreign relationships the public feels most wary about and which ones the different parties feel stronger and more confident to talk about. For instance, last year when President Yoon traveled to Washington DC and gave a speech in English before the US Congress, a leading left-wing politician publicly accused him of sadejui in this online chat forum uh, because the speech was given in English. And uh, conservatives immediately hit back and pointed out that South Korea's first progressive president, Kim Dae-jung, also gave a speech in English before the US Congress. And at the time, nobody accused him of Sade Jui. Professor Shaw, just two minutes. If Thank you. That's okay. So on the other side, uh, the term has been leveled against progressive leaders several times in the last year to imply that they have this overly cozy attitude towards China or Xi Jinping. For instance, last June, uh, China came to the forefront after the Chinese ambassador to Seoul made this kind of insensitive remark that uh, South Koreans who bet against China will surely regret it. And this really hit a nerve with the, the Korean public and the right wing was quick to seize on it because uh, he made the remark in a meeting with the, the leader of the Democratic Party, uh, Lee, Jing, Lee Jae Myung. And uh, the, so the situation had already drawn attention to China right at the moment when it so happened that several Democratic Party lawmakers were about to make a scheduled trip to Beijing. They also visited a Tibetan cultural exhibition put on by the Communist Party. And uh, this drew prompt criticism from right wing leaders who, as you can see, they accused the Democratic Party of uh, bribery, tribute diplomacy and flunkyism. So, again, this is theme of being subordinate to a great power is the biggest sin. Um, and then just last month, the Democratic Party leader got negative attention for some remarks he made criticizing President Yoon's uh, policy on the Taiwan Straits. He said that instead of antagonizing China, they should just say xie xie to China and then say xie xie to Taiwan as well. And uh, conservatives fired back that this was more evidence of the left's subservient and biased attitude towards China, and they seemed particularly pounce on the Chinese phrase xie xie uh, as a sign of flunkyism. They really didn't like that. Um, so in some, that this idea of subservience has a strong emotional pull in South Korean politics. And I think this traces its roots back to the 20th century and Korea's experience of being at the mercy of foreign powers. Uh, but such language clearly gets weaponized by both sides in competing contexts, and it has strong populist undertones. So in conclusion, just some, some questions to think about. Um, when, you know, when is, is, diplo is diploma dis diplomatic efforts diplomacy labeled subservient? Uh, how does uh, anti-China rhetoric in South Korea differ from that in the West, uh, particularly in terms of anti-communism? And um, finally, uh, 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 in the face of rising China with this increase, increasingly threatening economic and military presence, is there a way for East Asia's de democratic leaders to confront the CCP without falling into uh, the the trap of right wing populism. Thank you, Professor Shaw. Thank you very much, and thank you for um, dealing with those technical issues, which I, I'm sure were uh, not what you wanted at the beginning. But um, appreciate your patience and handling all of that. Um, I'm sure we'll want to come back and talk about issues of agency as well, and whether that's 
kind of mirror image of this sense of subordination um, and to what extent is agency or the desire for agency a, dr a driver in fueling populist politics, um, both in South Korea and, of course, maybe also in the context of Japan, where the sort of China binary is also um, given Japan's economic dependence on China and its growing security concerns, something that can divide politicians on the left and the right. But let's move on to uh, Professor Sang Jin Han, Emeritus Professor of Sociology at Seoul National University, um, for his presentation entitled Transformation of Populist Emotion in Korean Politics from 2016 to 2024. Uh, Professor Han, over to you. I think you may be muted still, Professor Han, if you could unmute yourself. Um, uh, uh, we still can, can you hear me? Yes, now, okay. now you're back. Thank okay, you. Good. Well, I am deeply impressed by the overall observation and the comment made by John about uh, Korean politics in general, particularly the role of controversial aspect of the role of the uh, populism involved in Korean politics. And I also learned a lot about the role of emotion in contemporary politics, which is now going on before the general election on uh, uh, May, uh, April 3rd. Now, what I'm doing uh, is about you know, 15 minutes is to present what I found most interesting thing in my research, historically as well as empirical research. Um, what I found is that um, the role, okay, hey, okay. The, uh, the consequence of the populism has something to do with the definitional criteria of the populism. You know, populism is composed of two elements. One is a high extent of distrust, anger, hatred of the uh, ruling class, professional politics on the one hand, and uh, the primacy of the people as the sovereign actor which should lead to the politics. So these two elements are combined together to form a kind of a populism. And I tried in my presentation how this populist emotion composed of these two elements has evolved in Korea, South Korea, from uh, the last quarter of the 19th century to the, uh, to the present. But I will skim over very shortly about the historical observation here. OK. Um, can we move further? Okay, well, the first, can I can I move here or not? No? Well, uh, who controlled this PowerPoint now here? Should I do or not? Uh, I have a control. Okay, uh, I, I should move. I, I like to move very quickly, so, you know, so. Okay. Um, yes. The next slide. Can can we see the next slide? Which one second? Which page you want me to? No, but this is the one. the first. No, oh, oh, I see. Okay. Okay, which page right. you want me to click in? Well, I don't know. Uh, but I should I should move step by step very quickly though. Okay. okay, this is the okay, first yeah. stage. Okay, the first stage is about um, the, the last quarter of the 19th century when the nation uh, faced the severe national crisis. And then the second stage. Can we move very quickly? Yes, we're on the second stage presentation. No, the, in the second stage. I don't see the second stage here. Talk, talk slight, Shema. Talk slight. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> so sorry. Then we are going in like this. Oh, just so that, okay, second stage. Second stage is concerned about the Japanese colonial rule. Uh, so uh, in this uh, stage, uh, the particularly the high extent of anger, hatred, you know, the sentiments emerged as a main form, main energy of populism in Korea. Quite understandable. And the third stage. It's a, related to the Korean War from 1950 to 1953. And this is also related to the expression of a high level of uh, distrust, anger, hatred of 
North Korea. Uh, and the fourth stage is related to uh, democratization during the 1980s. And this is a very important uh, form of populism in Korea, um, led by uh, college students as well as a progressive intellectual, which tried to reformulate, re-embed uh, you know, the uh, original uh, populist aspect in the uh, last quarter of the uh, 19th century. So they really proclaimed the primacy of the people as the main sovereign actor of the politics. And this uh, was uh, the main driving forces of populism and democratic movement. And the, finally, the fifth stage is related to digitalized populism. Uh, oh, this is no, fifth stage, the digitalized populism. Uh, so because Korea enjoyed the, the high extent of digitalized culture and the communication, populist movement also emerged using this digitalized technology to a high extent. And therefore, we see the, the confrontation of um, uh, uh, elements. Okay, this is a genealogical crisis uh, during, the, during the last about 100 years or so, you know. And the next stage, uh, Okay. Uh, okay. The final stage we see the two populist movement. What is candlelight versus uh, and uh, candlelight Brazil versus national flag? You know? and this is very interesting uh, kind of phenomenon right? because uh, these two populist movement crashed in the downtown of Seoul in nine, the 2016 and 2017. But there was a no confrontation, no uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, victim. Uh, it was a very peaceful, but nonetheless they coexisted in the downtown of the Seoul for several months. And this expressed in the two forms. One is kind of anti-populist, uh, anti-politician kind of movement, and the other one is uh, the, the really the primacy of the people as the main sovereign actor in Korean politics. That is a more or less a Republican aspect. The first the hatred aspect is you know, kind of very negative energy of the populism. What I found, what I found in my research is that whether uh, populism works as a promoter of democracy or a, a kind of a, kind of barrier to democracy, it has something to do with this definitional criteria of a populism. That means whether the, the populist movement express the hatred and the anger, the, the sentiment, uh, mostly, or whether the populism express also the principle of the primacy of the people as the main sovereign actor of the democratic movement. You know, and uh, in our experiences, uh, as we can see uh, in 19, 2016 and the 17, can we see the the flag? The figure, okay, here, uh, of course, uh, this, um, uh, okay, okay, these two light form, two forms, it's two uh, form of populist movement are very diverging, very, um, very different in terms of many elements. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, my, my, my study showed that the uh, candlelight Virgil turned out to be very much constructive to um, uh, uh, strengthening democracy, whereas uh, national flag movements, uh, which led by more conservative old people, they may seem to track the, sec the security or safety of you know, democracy. Anyway, uh, therefore, I, um, I conducted more empirical research uh, thereafter. Uh, by collecting survey data uh, in Korea, and it shows how they are different. These two types of uh, uh, populist movements are uh, different from each other, from many uh, different uh, aspects. And, and, and then, and then um, uh, let me see here. Next, please. Okay, populism and democracy. An, an empirical survey research was conducted in nine, 2018 to investigate the relation between candlelight Virgil versus the national flag of populist movement and democracy. Regression analysis demonstrate that candlelight Virgil is internally associated with the primacy of the people, while the national flag movement is associated with the distrust of elites. 
uh, originating from the difference, the national flag movement embodied a belief in autocracy and thus was uh, arguably a threat to democracy, whereas the candlelight Virgil functioned to protect the democracy from regressing. And I show some uh, available empirical example here. This is a regression analysis. Uh, as we can see, uh, the um, a national flag movement is deeply associated with the distrust of the elite, whereas the candlelight Virgil is deeply associated with the people primacy. And this is quite interesting discovery that I found, you know. And therefore, based upon this, uh, we can show uh, the path analysis. As you can see in this analysis, candlelight Virgil orientation. Uh, this has nothing to do with the support of strong authoritarian leader, whereas national flag orientation is deeply associated with the support for strong authoritarian leader, which means actually uh, whether the populism uh, is good for democracy or bad for democracy is not determined by populist, populism itself, but determined by whether this populist movement express anger and resentment and antagonism uh, more visibly uh, than the principle of the primacy of the people. When the populist movement advocates the people as the main actor, primary sovereign actor, it could pro promote democracy, uh, protecting democracy from regression. That is our historical uh, ex ex example in Korea. Yeah. And so therefore, uh, important of definitional criteria of a populist movement. That's what I want to emphasize. The empirical study has demonstrated that the threat to liberal democracy does not come from the candlelight movement, but rather from national flag movement. Political distrust as a definitional criteria of populism may pose a threat to democracy via manifestation of such a populist emotion as hatred, resentment, antagonism. In contrast, the primacy of the people seem to promote the democracy by advocating the active role of the people as a sovereign actor uh, in democratic politics. Okay. Now, the water where we are now, you know, the current situation of 2004, you know, the general election will be held on April 10, 20, 20, 2024. As an election strategy, both the ruling conservative and the opposition progressive parties compete severely in utilizing the populist emotions such as hatred and resentment by demonizing the counterpart. The ruling party accuses the opposition party as North Korean follower, jeopardizing the security of liberal democratic South Korea, whereas the opposition party accuses the ruling party as Japanese compradors, uh, destroying the pride of the sovereign nation. The emotion deeply rooted in genealogical crisis of populism in Korea. So my conclusion is that as um, uh, John observed, uh, Korean politics may seem to be very much healthy, very stimulating, and also constructive uh, in terms of two-party politics. They may look like very healthy, okay, very good. But nonetheless, uh, as time goes by, so we are uh, moving toward a very dangerous state as of today because this political party rely too much on the hatred feeling of populism rather than the principle of the primacy of the people. So that is because uh, the Korean politics seems to be too much politized, politicized and also populist emotion evolved very rapidly by accusing each other as a kind of a devil, as an enemy, uh, evil, you know, something like that. And that makes many people worrying about the future of Korea uh, because the populism as such is not good or bad, but it could be good or it could be bad. But the way in which populist emotion expresses itself this day seems to be moving in a more dangerous, very negative, destructive kind of uh, uh, tendency. So um, we, are, we are very, we, ha we have to be very careful about it to distinguish these different elements of the populism to see the function of populism in the future. That is my main conclusion. Thank you very much. Yeah. Professor Han, thank you for um, a fascinating presentation and also reminding us of the historical roots of some of this antagonism and mutual distrust. And it, it sort of raises an interesting question, doesn't it? If we think comparatively, is it is it that history itself 
in the Korean context, which is part and parcel of the contemporary situation? Uh, and how does Korea compare with other countries? Um, because as, as I think many of us have observing the rise of populist politics in Europe and North America will have noticed, it seemed like quite a surprise that um, politics should embrace this more um, dichotomous oppositional type of discourse, um, given that we've had institutional frameworks to allow left and right and all the different shades in between to be able to engage in, in public discourse. So again, that's something perhaps for the Q&A session to, to try and understand what it is about historical precedent that helps to explain the current situation. But let us move on to our next speaker, Dr. Jin Yong Lee, research professor in the School of International Relations at the University of Ulsan in South Korea for his presentation entitled Nationalism and Resilience of Authoritarian Rule in North Korea. Professor Lee. Yes, I prepare share my screens. Yeah, is it okay to share the screen and sounds? Still okay? Yep, thank you. So in North Korea, nationalism plays a crucial role in the regime's survivors, the blending ideological control with authoritarian strengths. These presentations dive into how the regime has historically used the nationalism intervening the uh, family lineages with a national uh, narrative to solidify the power. I analyzed the relationship between nationalisms and the regime stability or regime durability, drawing on the data from the KCNA the regarding the nationalistic rhetoric and higher ranking Politburo, the visit to emblematic the site. So while the nationalism has intensified under the Kim Jong-un's rules, is part of the broader strategies alongside the claim of the economic ponies uh, to bolster regime legitimacy. However, uh, this resilience, or sorry, the, this reliance on the nationalism to reveal its limitations, especially is propping up authoritarian rules without economic the success. So these presentations shed light on the, the intricate the dynamics of authoritarian resilience and the law of nationalism to contemporary North Korean uh, society. So <clears throat> uh, these pictures so describe the notable moment from the North Korean media in 2019, showcasing the Kim Jong-un's riding the white horse in the back to mountain regions and visiting the historic sites uh, linked to the anti-Japanese guerrilla movement. While some may find that these images are very uh, uh, peculiar, <laughs> they are carefully crafted to promote Kim Jong-un's leadership, drawing the parallel his grandfather's Kim Il-sung. Uh, these uh, orchestrate the activities serve a deliberate attempt to reinforce the narrative of continuity and the legitimacy of the within the regimes. So according to the BDM data, the North Korea exhibits some similar patterns superior to the de-Stalinizations era. However, following the de-Stalinizations and the Sino-Soviet dispute, the Kim Il-sung adopt some our own style socialism or Juche ideologies. During the period of the regime crisis, uh, the subsequent rulers have uh, relied on the incentivizing the foundational myths, ideologies, and personalisms to mobilize the collective memories, the particularly the uh, harkening back to the 1970s, so-called North Korean Belle Epoque. This underscores some significance of North Korean nationalisms in the shaping its regime the strategies or regime resilience. So here's the interesting posters, so propaganda posters. The constructions of a specific vision of the past is serve as a tool for legitimations uh, in the North Korea. In the 1990s, the propaganda posters highlight the foundational means to reinforce the present regime's authorities. 
why some North Korean refugees acknowledge that oh these uh, posters is a manipulation of the such discourse, but some interviews also reveal so say that some nostalgia for some sense of unity the fostered by the nationalistic rhetoric, which serve as a basis for the social cohesions. So the one of my previous research, these figures uh, present the outcome of text analysis of a New Year statement of North Korea. So it's related to the nationalistic discourse across so different rulers. Uh, during the Kim Il-sung era, there are frequent references to the revolutionary legacy. In the Kim Jong-il era, there was some blend of the foundation of myths and cult of personality, particularly emphasizing some loyalty to the ruler and the Suryang systems. However, due to the relatively shorter the durations of Kim Jong-un's regimes, it challenges to define the clear strategies, the legitimations based on nationalistic discourse. Uh, however, there are some appear, uh, so, uh, to be uh, mixtures with a, a less emphasis on cult of the personality compared to his fathers. So uh, one of the other examples is that the Cholima movement in the North Korea uh, could be is exemplify the utilizations of nationalisms for regime resilience during the period of the crisis. Initially, it convinced as a mass mobilization effort akin to the stand-up style movement in Soviet Union or the Great Leap Forward in China. It later becomes uh, some cornerstone of the legitimations for the successive rulers, such as Kim Il-sung engineered the movement to address economic challenges and foster some foundational means and surrounding the anti-Japanese guerrilla legacies. Subsequent rulers, including the Kim Jong Il and Kim Jong Un, invoke some Taliban movement during the time of crisis, using the collective memory to bolster nationalisms and a loyalty to the regimes. These mobilizations of collective memory is evident the, in the recent versions Maliba movement under the Kim Jong Un. It underscores. Uh, enduring law or nationalistic discourse in the North Korean regime resilience. So uh, to reassess the relationship between North Korean nationalistic discourse and the regime legitimations for the resilience, uh, these presentations draw upon some unstructured data from the KCNA, the Korean Center News Agency, the focusing on nationalistic rhetoric and higher ranking Politburo bureau visit to emblematic the national nationalist side. Uh, so these data came from the NK Pro or KCNA Watch. So the challenge is like the defining the element of North Korean nationalisms. So during the authoritarian nationalism literatures, particularly the works of Johannes Groshowski or Alexander Tukarski's, so adjacent concept of North, North Korean nationalism are identified for some analysis. Uh, for dealing with that, I use some MBIBO, so quality with youth uh, software, and the word is a related concept of nations, and it's defined with the text corpus in the facilitating the deeper examinations of nationalist, nationalistic themes and KCNA contents. So these figures describe the combined bar and the line graphs illustrating the number of reference. So the, just the concept of the nations and the ratio of these reference uh, annual KCNA articles from the 2005 and the 2018. The bar represents the absolute count of the reference itself, while the line indicate the ratio, the reference of the year over years. So from 2005 to 2010, so there is a general decline in the number of reference itself with a notable peak, uh, 2011, as we all know that the Kim Jong uh, Un's associations. This peak suggests the highlighted focus on the national concept during the time, uh, the potentially aim to the solidify the Kim Jong Un's leaderships and the reinforce so national ideologies align with his successions. 
So these figures display the frequency of visit by higher ranking members of North Korean Politburo's categorized the political part, military part, and economic part focused from the 1990, sorry, 1994 to 2015. These figures uh, show that the fluctuations in the engagement across three domains uh, creating with the key leaderships so transitions. The following Kim Jong Il successions in the uh, 1994, uh, there are some increase in the political and the military uh, military the engagement, the possibly the indicating power consolidations and emphasis on military strengths and the nationalistic the focus, so called Sungun Sungun politics. Economic engagement remained lower during this period. So this suggesting so it is a secondary priority at that time. The leading up to the following the Kim Jong Un succession in 2011, there is a dramatic spike in the all areas, uh, with the most notably increasing part is economic engagement. So these shifts may reflect the strategic emphasis on economic development to legitimize the regimes and promote uh, the form of nationalisms tied to the progress and resilience. So uh, based on this uh, preliminary the research, so there are three the, uh, findings in here. The first thing is that there's some decline in the nationalist rhetoric in the KCNA. The publication suggests some strategic the reorientations of state propaganda, possibly it's reflecting the broader policy shift. Initially, they used the consolidate Kim Jong-un's uh, legitimacy. <clears throat> Uh, the reductions maybe may indicate in the growing the confidence in the regime stabilities, allowing the focusing on other themes like economic development or diplomacy, uh, aligned with the North Korean adaptive governance approach. The second point is that downturn in the nationalistic contents uh, could be a response to the internal challenges such as economic hardships or changing the public receptions influenced by external informations. These shift the narrative, the focus aim to the address urgent issues while the maintaining the uh, credibility among the populace, the reflecting the regime's uh, sen uh, sensitivity uh, to the public perception shift. The third point is that the uh, these reductions in the nationalist electorate may acknowledge some challenges posed by global information accessibilities and aligned with economic uh, imperatives. So these shift some media focus toward economic issues, prepare some populace, the potentials, the policy changes and initiatives, and reflecting some increasing the influence of economic factors of North Korean policy propaganda. So, these analyses provide some insight into potential societal or political shift reflecting the changing patterns of nationalistic discourse under the Kim Jong-un's rules, offering some nuanced understanding of North Korean uh, evolving the state narrative. So there's some four implications of this finding. The first one is that the utilizing nationalism serve as a crucial tool for ensuring regime resilience in North Korea, the bolstering the loyalty and the unity among the populace. The second point is that the power, uh, performance legitimations alongside the nationalist rhetoric is uh, essential for maintaining the regime stability as uh, it demonstrates the legitimate ability to meet the socioeconomic the needs of the populations, therefore enhancing its legitimacy. The third point is that the lives of the Jiang Madang generations is exposed the market-oriented the systems and the lacking the direct experience of state provisions. They posed some challenges, the regime's the traditional mechanisms of the control of this uh, uh, legitimacy. The last point is a very interesting point when we discuss to navigate the challenges posed by this generational shift. The regimes must the implement effective cooperation strategies to adapt the changing the demographic changes and maintaining grip on power. 
So this is my last slide. The final implications point to suggest a potential avenue uh, for the further research to investigating the influence of North Korean nationalist discourse, the regime stabilities the amidst challenges posed by the Changmadang generations and the potential, I mean the potential post-generation ruler. Uh, this research, uh, this presentation would deepen our understanding of the factors uh, which shaping the authoritarian rule in the North Korea. So thank you so much for attention of, uh, during the presentations. Professor Lee, thank you very much for uh, another fascinating presentation, and one in a way that's slightly counterintuitive to uh, to see a decline in nationalism as a animating factor in the strength of the regime at a time when we see nationalism on the rise in so many other um, political environments, both authoritarian and democratic. Um, it does also beg the question if performance legitimization is a key factor in underpinning durability of the regime, what happens if North Korea finds it harder to deliver performance? Will there be a reversion to a more nationalistic agenda? Let us move on um, to our very last presentation. Uh, uh, Professor Mina Sumadi, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, um, senior researcher at the San Maral Foundation in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia for her presentation entitled Populist Nationalism as a Challenge to Democratic Stability in Mongolia very much for the introduction. And um, thank you for having me here. Okay, just one second, I'll launch my presentation. Okay, uh, can you all see it? Let's see. Okay, uh, so just to give I you the context. I don't think we can see it yet, actually. All right, I can't, okay. No. Oh, yeah. Where's the problem? Hmm. That's not fun. May I, I'm not very technically. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Great. Okay. Uh, so certain things to give you about the context for the populism's rise in Mongolia. It was uh, 1985. All the post-communist revolution started. So the democratic system was implemented. It gave a lot of rise to new political forces, relaxation of the political control of the main party. And in a way, uh, Mongolia can be considered an anomaly among post-communist countries because the main ruling party is the former communist party that managed to successfully rebrand itself in the democratic era. And uh, by now, due to the loss of the main opposition party, the Democratic Party, you could almost say that Mongolia has entered a prolonged period of one party dominance since 2016. And as of a couple of weeks ago, I was informed that the latest uh, ranking of variety of democracies actually downgraded Mongolia's status from electoral democracy now into the gray zone. So by now it is uh, somewhere in between electoral democracy and electoral autocracy. 2023. So back democratic backsliding has already occurred. It was a pro a work in progress, but uh, by now it's more or less certain that uh, there are some issues with democ democracy. And uh, uh, this little slide would also give additional context. So uh, what was going on is since the democratic uh, transition occurred, uh, 1990s was pretty much an economic recession in the country. So there wasn't a lot going on other than um, the country trying to get back on track. And uh, it was heavily relied on Soviet Union for subsidies. And once all those subsidies were gone, uh, the market really had to reinvent itself, open up, establish new connections. And uh, there was this push towards East Asian orientation, since so the big, bigger market, more prospects. And uh, by two, thousands, uh, what happened was a mining boom occurred. Uh, it is actually a very important factor in Mongolia's development because it is considered one of the reasons why Mongolia managed to democratize successfully compared to a lot of other 
post-Soviet countries is that the mining sector wasn't as developed during the transitional period in 1990s. So it was mostly that there is a lag effect of this uh, so-called resource purse hitting the country. So 2000s is also the time when um, mining boom was brought economic growth, but at the same time, there was rising inequality because uh, the profits from mining wasn't really equally shared and pretty much concentrated at the top. And uh, as you can see from this chart, the economic growth line is having this very much upwards, well, with fluctuations, but an upward movement. So the economy was recovering thanks to the uh, mining revenue, uh, pretty much driving the whole economy up. But at the same time, uh, what is important is the poverty headcount. Well, extreme poverty, uh, which is uh, what I have uh, added here, was pretty high during transitional time. So it, this is uh, just the extreme poverty, like the poverty level itself. Well, some economists suggest that you need to double this number. At other times, they also say that you have to triple this number to get the actual, uh, I would say, um, idea of the extent of poverty in the country. So um, 90s would be like 36, it is, um, well, 30 something percent for extreme poverty. And it only improved like since pretty much 2010s. But still uh, what happened was it's uh, the biggest criticisms that the governments have received is that the poverty headcount has not been reduced significantly. There is improvement, but it fluctuated and um, not according to the revenue that the national economy has been receiving. So this is also something that uh, is a better indicator than the Gini coefficient because uh, a lot of uh, analysts like to use Gini coefficient for inequality. But in case of Mongolia, I would just uh, suggest that Gini is not a very good indicator. There is really high inequality. The problem is like um, most of the wealth is really concentrated at a very small percentage at the top. So you wouldn't be able to get a good grasp from the general index like that. So at the same time with all of this, uh, say like all of this money being pumped into the economy, a lot of uh, foreign direct investment coming in, there are problems with corruption because as Mongolia de democratized, it didn't really uh, have a lot of institutions of control over this. So corruption and especially grand corruption became bigger and bigger problem with m mining. So all those challenges that are known in academia as the resource curse pretty much over time had hit. So let's say that uh, for the period from 1989 to 20. 22, well, actually, I would make a correction, 1992 to 2022 would be when Mongolia is mostly categorized as an electoral democracy, but starting from 2023, it is now officially like gray zoned. So, um, as you can see, all of this corruption and inequality pretty much uh, really increased the number of people who believe that there is no, there is a lot of injustice in the society. So this is a real uh, important factor. And you can see almost like uh, it reached its height like in pre-pandemic years, like 2018, 2019. It can also explain why, why protests, number of protests have been growing in the country. So there's a, a lot of, uh, uh, a big segment of the population that believes uh, that, that the, Mm, the situation is unjust. And um, another fa factor is that uh, main institutions in the country have started to lose a lot of legitimacy because um, most people just don't believe that uh, the main parties, the main institutions can resolve problems. It is not in their interest. There's a lot of cynicism going on. But from this graph, what I would like to say that the lowest legitimacy that is, is experience is by political parties. They're pretty much at the bottom of this trust list. So next turn. And then as you can see also the perception of corruption is very high. So the majority of people believe that, I agree with the statement that corruption is a common place. And um, from as far as polls have been conducted, yeah, this number has been growing. So the vast majority believes there's too much corruption and it's a commonplace. 
So this all sort of paints the picture of why currently there's a crisis of political parties. So mo most people just don't believe that parties represent public opinion or are working in the interest of the population. And uh, this brings to the idea that um, another thing is that most parties in Mongolia, this it's a multi-party multi-party system was established. But even though it was a multi-party system, the majority electoral system over time resulted in two dominant parties. And uh, the parties are really uh, weakly institutionalized. You won't be able to see as much information about the development of their platforms over the years, the candidate speeches, maybe in some of the elections. I mean, for pres presidential elections, of course, yes, but for uh, parliamentary elections, the record keeping is rather poor. So it would be um, difficult to trace any of the candidates like in the earlier electoral cycles about the content of their speeches, their platforms. There are really no studies that will really compare whether they um, fulfilled any of their promises, which is why uh, I would say that you know, being this post-communist country with weakly institutionalized party system, uh, it became um, a challenge to really put any of the parties on this left-right spectrum because they don't really uh, have any consistencies in their, their individual politicians promising different things under the banner of the party, then the party not really re releasing their main campaign platform would make a real contradictory picture if you would really try to put any of the parties on, on the spectrum. Or at, at one election, they might be on the left side, on the other side, they might be leaning more towards the right. So for an analyst, this becomes um, not a very uh, solid empirical ground to really use this type of uh, distinction. Uh, another issue is, of course, the media. Uh, there are also rankings by Reporters Without Borders that trace that uh, actually, um, media freedom in Mongolia has been decreasing. And uh, from the very beginning, there were issues, of course, uh, that the media coverage was uh, firstly controlled by the communist government. Then with the relaxation in the democratic era, there are a lot more media channels, radio broadcasting going on, but most of them was, were private. The main state broadcaster remained, but uh, the private broadcasters are numerous. And um, I would say that their coverage uh, has some potential biases because a lot of them are linked to certain politicians and their interests. So the all oh, and yeah, not really. There is not much for independent or free media, I would say. And uh, another negative development was there's a lot of. Um, legislation that has been passed, especially they introduced a lot of laws that uh, uh, fine reporters for libel and defamation, and most recently there was even a reporter arrested, uh, which kind of increases self-censorship among journalists. So me media coverage has been a big problem for all of this. Uh, which is why I would say that for studying populism in Mongolia, I would just say that it is mostly important to rather focus on themes that appear in campaign promises of politicians. And uh, that would give a better idea, since as I said, they're poor record keeping and it's not systematic enough to really conduct serious content analysis. And then I would also say that um, analysis of or assessment of populism in Mongolia would have to be focused on the strategies that politicians deploy more than any kind of like ideological position that I mean, you know, because trying to systematically assess any ideology behind their worldview or their uh, program would also run into numerous issues of no internal consistency or no consistency from election to election. So that, that would be one of the challenges. Uh, for those reasons, I would just say that for most uh, types of populism that you can try to find, that uh, left-right wing populism themes will be uh, really not applicable. And uh, I would say that what you could more, 
how do you say, more properly assessed would be the types of economic populism present, cultural populism, and authoritarian populism. I'll give a few more details on that. <clears throat> so the manifestation of this economic populism is mostly in the populist resource nationalism. A lot of politicians like to deploy this uh, uh, this discourse narrative about this, our country, our resources. So this is, um, so it manifests itself in uh, them narrating about how they're in the interest of the poor versus some corrupt politicians. They're not talking about the whole, well, to a lesser extent, corruption of the party, but more about singling out individual politicians. And then also there's another narrative of about this um, Mongolian ownership versus foreign ownership of mining or strategic assets. Uh, and to a lesser extent, it's anti-establishment, especially with the now one party dominance in the political system, when there were still um, quite, quite a bit of going back and forth between Democratic Party and the uh, Mongolian People's Party, there was a bit of this anti-establishment among some politicians, but I think it is less now. They're trying to portray a big union and coalition ahead of elections in June this year. So yes, mostly I would just say that this uh, populist resource nationalist can be defined by this um, rhetoric that national wealth is not shared equally. They're talking about the poor and the corrupt politicians and also about uh, redistribution of national wealth. There's a lot of talk about injustice and some anti-corruption programs. And mostly it really results in a lot of social welfare promises at times that are brought up with all these uh, money distributions during campaigns or like an increasing of wealth, certain welfare policies. So over the years, there were many, some of them stayed. And I think a popular one is the child money program. Also at one time when uh, a well-known Mongolian populist politician, the foreign president Batuga, when he canceled pensioners debt, which is also not within uh, the, uh, say the constitutional uh, powers of the president. So th this was also definitely a move. So usually they run into the issues of making all those economic promises when without regard to the government budget, and also uh, in the setting when there's weak rule of law, there are many uh, promises made, but a lot of those, especially like anti-corruption efforts, they fail because uh, this, this legal system is not exactly independent and uh, the, the top remains untouched. And I would just say that uh, the negative effects of this branch of populism is that it really masks uh, problems of inequality. What, what I, applying this nationalist solution or just having some selection, selective justice, just going at certain politicians rather than addressing problems within the system, like the absence of rule of law or lack of independence of judiciary. They would just go for this or that a political figure that fell out of power or fell out of favor. And then um, more generally, this populist nationalism, it's more falls into the type of cultural populism. There's a lot of talk about our country. And uh, I think this emerges more during presidential election campaigns. And there's a lot of narratives about the like, ethnic origin of the presidential candidate. I'll just say that uh, this is also a rhetoric used to disqualify the opponent. So it is very often uh, half-centric. This is the main ethnic group in Mongolia. It has a lot of... Um, uh, when it addresses external cultural influences, it is uh, very much anti-Chinese and tries to sort of position how different Mongolia is from China. And it applies a lot of this us versus um, communist China, and then maybe at times weaponizing democracy. This also happens there, but mostly it has a focus on these cultural distinguish. But the uh, difficult part of it is um, they walk, politicians usually walk a very fine line playing on anti-Chinese sentiment because in ways that um, they might be trying to get rid of some of their opponents with this rhetoric, like trying to accuse them of having some Chinese connections, either in business or even at sometimes having some family background, have like really 
relations or relatives. So uh, definitely, this is not uh, the type of populism that helps within ethnic unity in the country because uh, when in presidential elections, they deploy this type of talk about how uh, being the true Mongolians and the most Mongolians of them all, usually the other ethnic groups have uh, a say that or have a bit of annoyance with, with this type of rhetoric. Professor Samadhi, we're almost out of time. So can I encourage you to, to yes. wrap up if possible? The last one. Yeah. Okay, so, and the last one, this is less clear than the other two ones. Uh, so it is about paternalist populism. Because this one, um, I wasn't sure as much whether to put it, but this is something that is deployed with, with really not having uh, the other. It is more present when uh, certain politicians, in terms of presidents, they talk about how we need a strong leader. And they're trying to kind of like justify some of their decisions by being the strong man. And the other one is maybe by the ruling party or the established party when they are talking about stability. And then in the name of stability, they're implementing a lot of reform that is actually anti-democratic. And, um, and they always say that this is in the name of stability and this is to be closer to the people and it is for the people. So it's most a post-fact type of populism that appears. But as I said, as compared to the other two, it doesn't really have the other clearly defined. And uh, yes, I just had to pop this one out as I'm the last speaker. <laughs> just say like I had too much fun playing with OpenAI to ask that to generate make Mongolia great again poster and like randomly it generated this. So it's just I have to uh, share this gem. <laughs> so yes, uh, thank you for you. Thank you for that. Um, that very. Uh, depressing in some respects, I, su I suppose, um, survey of the, the limits of democratic politics in contemporary Mongolia and the strength of all of this um, populist agenda. And your last slide, of course, reminds us that there's still a lot of change ahead of us looking ahead to November in the United States as well. Um, we ran over slightly, but we have about 20 minutes or so for Q&A. So can I invite members of the audience um, if you would like to raise questions, um, you can either do that directly by raising your hands or by putting questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then I will try and take as many questions as possible. Um, so we have a question. The first question I see from Bull and Kenneth um, for Professor Junyong Lee. And the question is, in your analysis of the interplay between nationalism and authoritarian resilience in North Korea, you mentioned the regime, regime's emphasis on national narratives and familial lineage, lineage to consolidate power. How does the regime's promotion of Juche ideology intersect with this narrative? And to what extent does it contribute to the regime's longevity and control over society? Professor Lee, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, the question is very long, and uh, <laughs> thank you so much for interest, uh, having interest in my presentations. <laughs> Sorry. So basically, Juche ideology, as we all know that, so it's a very totalitarian ideologies and very uh, North Korean versions of the strong ideologies. So we call that, that's the reason why many researchers point out the North Korean case is uh, ideologically introversions case uh, compared to the China or Vietnam. So in the the to, the study of the North Korean nationalism is very hard to distinguish what is the element of the Juche ideology part or uh, communism part and so on. And also the part of the nationalism itself. So some researchers the focusing on the fusions of its itself, the what are the element of the Juche ideologies, uh, uh, they have some the nationalistic discourse itself. So I think the North Korean rulers uh, over the seventy years, uh, the using the the collective memory, the key the element of the nationalism. I think uh, the North Korean nationalism is the the collective memory. How to North Korea manipulate? Uh, these memory politics. 
So this is the element, a uh, crucial element to the understanding how the North Korean regimes or this family rule, the focusing on uh, uh, show that the, the regime stability, especially we all know that they argue the, the fine foundational myth of the, the, the anti-Japanese guerrilla movement from the, his grandfathers, the Kim Il Sung's, right? So that's the reason why the why the Juche, the family lineages are a crucial part of the nationalisms of the North Korea. I hope this answer could be the partially answer to your long questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Lee, can I actually just follow up on that? Because um sure. your your observations about how nationalism is declining. Um, and at the same time, this role of uh, mythology and and family-based legitimacy seems, as you've very well documented, to be a key part of the way in which the leadership consolidates its authority. We've seen, of course, recently quite unprecedented efforts by the current leader to challenge some of those past decisions. So I suppose my question to you is, how how do you measure the effectiveness of this use of family narratives or mythologies associated with the North Korean regime in in bringing the people on side? And is the fact that Kim Jong-un is willing to distance himself from the policies of his father and grandfather before him um, a sign that, that popular legitimacy is arguably less important than it used to be in North Korea? Yeah, that's a, actually this great cash is to understand North Korean authoritarianisms because that's the challenges of the many researchers. It's hard to the engaging with the actual the legitimacy of uh, managing or the gauging that the legitimacy belief of the North Korean uh, ordinary people, isn't it? So the one of the limitations of this presentation is that uh, using the unstructured data, but is a lack of the not fully updated uh, recent the data is only covered the. Uh, the 2018, something like that. So yeah, it could be the backup, the current situations. So one of the listed my findings is that the when the legend faced the legend crisis, they bolstered <laughs> bolstered the this national discourse. So uh, so as you can see, the first uh, succession time, we can say that this is a crucial uh, legend crisis time. So that's the reason why they pick up. But after that, the the number of the reference of the nationalism or nationalistic the uh, element could be decreased. But uh, when we think about the COVID situations or economic the disasters, the recently, so we can say that the, in that time, the North Korean regimes uh, promote again the this nationalist discourse but actually it's, it's a very challenging to how the everyday i mean the sorry it's a, uh ordinary north korean the peoples actually believe these legitimacy uh 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 i mean the legitimacy belief uh, or not so that's one of the challenges of as a researchers. So that's the reason why we using some of these unstructured data or based on the, the interview from the refugees currently escaped from North Korea. So yeah. Okay. Um we have one other question at the moment in the chat box. Um I also want to encourage um my fellow panelists to if you have questions that you would last like to direct to one another feel free to do that as well, because obviously there's a lot of overlap um, between the different presentations. Um, Saron Obia has a question for all of us, uh, referencing an interview that Farid Zakaria took with the Prime Minister of Singapore in 1994, entitled Culture as Destiny, um, and the impact of socioeconomic development in Singapore's case, but I think they're thinking the questioner is thinking more broadly in terms of the Korean context. The question is, can South Korea stand the nuclear propaganda of North Korea? Um, uh, Professor Shaw, you highlighted the role of North versus South Korea um, in terms of how the 
how the sort of changing dynamic in South Korea uh, and these populist themes that are used by left and right are being um, adopted by different sides of the political division. Is that a question that you'd like to reflect on a little? Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure what the what is meant by nuclear propaganda, but mm. uh, I assume that means just the nuclear tests that are that ha happened, um, um, which were real. Uh, they were not propaganda, but um, I, you know, the the. Uh, Political theory would teach us that external threats should, if anything, make a, a democracy or should make a, a state stronger in reaction to an external stimulus, especially when uh, people in South Korea are already primed to uh, resist North Korea and to, you know, when when threatened by North Korea to be, to bind together more strongly. Um, <laughs> If if anything, I yeah, I think they could use a little more prop nuclear propaganda right now. Is it you know the things fall apart when they they see different threats and they don't know which one is the most pressing. Um, but uh, in terms of the other North Korean propaganda, which is often talked about, and I think Dr. Lee talked about in his talk a little bit, the nationalist propaganda from North Korea, the you know cultural nationalism is much more pervasive, pers persuasive towards certain sectors of South Korea than a nuclear threat. Um, and and I think that's something that the conservatives in South Korean politics have always felt more wary of is that certain South Koreans might think that North Korea is actually more authentically Korean because of their propaganda message. Um, and that has more to do with the, the cultural argument uh, that, you know, cultural unity that is falling by the wayside now increasingly with Kim Jong-un. Um, and I, I'd be fascinated to, to hear uh, Dr. Lee's uh, um, uh, in, input on, on that development as well. But uh, for my two cents, I, I think South Korea can definitely withstand the nuclear uh, uh, threats from North Korea. And it's an interesting point, isn't it? Um, given the popularity of Korean soft power and Korea's increased global prominence, um, one might assume that Koreans on either side of the political divide, left or right in South Korea, would be feeling inherently more confident, more um, at ease with their, their national identity, if you like. Um, so it seems pe peculiar that we're seeing this apparent intensification of left-right divisions um, and competition to to claim the mantle of national legitimacy when there should be things that bring people together. Um, I don't have an easy explanation for that, but um, again, something for us to think about. Um, we have another question, um, this time for uh, Professor Sumadi. Um, considering Mongolia's unique trajectory in democratization and recent challenges, particularly in the context of its resource-based economic development and the emergence of populism, what specific factors do you believe have contributed to Mongolia's distinctiveness amongst post-Soviet republics in the region? Uh, and then how do these factors shape Mongolia's prospects for democratic stability or instability? Big question. Um, can, whichever element of that you'd like to have a crack at. Okay. Um... Let's see. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, some scholars consider that one of the factors that helped Mongolian democratization among the post-Soviet states, uh, Mongolia wasn't really part of the Soviet Union, it was a political satellite. So it already had all the elements of uh, independent statehood at the time of the democratization. So it didn't really, it had two processes of democratization and marketization, but not, not as much about uh, state building or nation building which uh, was something that was very important for the Soviet states as, um, in Central Asia. Uh, they had to spend a lot more resources towards that in the beginning. But um, as I noted earlier, what helped was this um, resource curse actually hit Mongolia later because the mining sector really uh, took off its development in 2000s when, for um, example, in states such as Kazakhstan, they already had their resource 
and mining sector developed very, very much in the, the early 90s and during the Soviet Union, they already had all these big projects. Um, there's a hand raised, is it re related to my answer? Uh, okay, so continue. Uh, so yes, I think resources were really a big um, this difference uh, one of the big differences and also about this not being as much part of the Soviet Union. So I would say that extent of Russification wasn't as high. And there was a lot more in terms of national identity, less ethnic conflict. There are ethnic minorities in Mongolia, but they're really a small percent of the population. So that doesn't really affect as much uh, system. So I wouldn't say that it is uh, a factor that can destabilize, destabilize the system. So it's mostly about social cohesion. And um, I would say that the prospects of democratic stability really depend on how much the ruling party right now is willing to evolve. Right now, it really doesn't show as many signs. It really beat the opposition. And I mean, it, uh, there is not much of an opposition in the system right now. But if they will remember the history of like late 90s and early 2000s when they really accepted defeat and the political elite at the time decided to like uh, that democracy is something that they would stick on to and they can come back within the system democratically and uh, sort of relax relaxed their control of uh, all the country's resources and pretty much allowed other parties to um, de develop and grow i would just say that right now i think we're at the turning point and hopefully the um, the stability of democracy will depend on how this ruling party will act for these elections and whether it will relax its uh, hold over the smaller parties and their uh, chances. And yeah, the instability really de depends on uh, what, if on on their willingness to uh, how to say once again allow uh, more freedoms. Because uh, in their rhetoric, they sometimes uh, talk about democracy being unstable, but the reality is that the, the solution that they chose of like concentrating power and really creating more and more uh, cases for protest among the population, that creates more instability that I would say than the other side. I hope I somewhat answered the question. Oh, there's... Thank one. you, Dr. Osmoidi. Thank you. Related question by Meredith, you paint a very depressing picture. Yes, I would just say, um, let me try the words. Yeah, do you want to crack, have a have a response to Meredith's question? Yes, I quickly look at you. They've lost faith in politicians. I suppose it raises another question is, is there an appetite for engagement in political life? And where uh, do yes. Mongolians see that as a... best? best taking place which in which I, arena i would just say that they actually lo lost faith in uh political parties and established politics so newcomers mm. still have uh, a chance especially among the population and that's why there are, people still believe in protest and the government is trying to kind of curtail uh, the chances of the protest but otherwise uh, i think the younger population is very much in mind that they want to be active and they want change and uh, they they would like to be engaged in politics more. So I would say um, drives voters. Polls. I mean, the voter turnout is decreasing. It is still relatively high, but I mean, compared to what it was in the 90s with like 90 something percent, in upper 80s for voter turnout. Now we have like 70s for the parliamentary election and upper 60s for presidential election. The voter poll turnout is going down. But uh, I think. Um, I just say the established parties are working hard to try to get everybody to pull to come and vote by right? choosing the dates that are most convenient and giving time off work or just really trying to engage the population. So that is my answer, I hope. Okay, um, let's try and squeeze in two more questions. Um, I know we're running short of time. Joe Ellis, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I've got quite a few questions about Mongolia, but I think I'll email you just because it's becoming very Mongol centric. And that's great. But, you know, just to kind of make it a bit more general. And this is 
actually Toya, Toya, your question is quite similar to mine, which is really, I'm not a specialist of um, populism. I'm an anthropologist and there's other anthropologists in the room. And I'm kind of interested in the way that any of the panelists think about emotion as almost a symptom of populism, right? Because I guess, I guess the anthropologist and many other person will say politics has always been a realm of emotion, right? And just in hope for change and these kinds, it's an emotional space and it is entirely actually appropriate that it's a realm of emotion. And then we can say, okay, so maybe we're talking about in populism, kind of destructive emotions. So we might say anger, right? But then equally you come back and you say, well, there's very good reasons people should feel angry and would motivate political action, if you see what I mean. And Joseph, I saw in your in your talk this idea of the vehemence, which I think is really interesting, this kind of idea that actually this could be a way of defining a particular kind of emotion that is a particularly associated with populism. So, I mean, I guess, do you agree with that? And a wider question is whether actually we could identify any particular kind of emotion that was particularly kind of characteristic as populism or are just emotions that play in, po in politics all the time and it just so happens they play out in certain ways in populist politics, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, should, we, uh, should we start with Joseph then? Yep, Joseph, go sure, ahead. I'd like to, sure, I'd like to address both Joe and Tuya, the role of emotion and gender. And I see like both right wing and left wing popular. Well, for me, populism is a strong emotion most associated with Korean populism is animosity, vehemence. And they use gender, they weaponize gender in very strategic ways. So for example, like the left wing, they talk, you know, they're all that's why they talk about comfort women. That that, you know, it's always like Japanese men who victimize Korean women, and the women represent like Korean virtue. Uh, but interestingly, the right wing populists are the same. And so they're always talking about the North Koreans, like the pleasure, like the pleasure teams, right? And so this is kind of like North Korea's version of the comfort woman. And just as a reminder, uh, <clears throat> so the current leader, Kim Jong-un, uh, she's actually Korean Japanese, right? And so the, you know, Kim, uh, so Kim Jong-un's father was famous for having many, many girlfriends. And so, uh, and so Kim Jong-un's mother was never married to, uh, you know, to the, you know, Kim jong il right? So, uh, but it just turned out that but so the so the so I think you know right wing populists also you know they kind of just they kind of uh, weaponize gender, whether it's uh, <clears throat> whether it's like North Korean leaders uh, like exploiting women, or for Chinese they there is a there's kind of a there's kind of an urban myth called Changi Meme, where you have these kind of Chinese organ traders, and they're targeting like you know vulnerable like Korean women and they're. They're, you know, they're taking their organs away. And then, uh, yeah, so it's like an urban myth. And interestingly, half of my students believe in this urban myth. They think that there's Chinese organ traders out there, you know, targeting like young Korean men and especially girls. Um, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's a very strong and emotion of like victimhood and animosity, uh, which weaponizes gender. That's my point number one. But my point number two is, a lot of this populism is kind of limited. I think it's kind of limited to uh, political elites. So we have a joke in Korea that uh, South, that at least South Korea, we're gonna disappear in like two hundred years because we're not we're just not producing any more children, right? So we're gonna go extinct. And so I'm wondering if all this kind of nationalist nationalism and animosity that is this something that really you know is this is this something that really like you know is it does this go beyond the elites, political activists, right? And so why is it that like, you know, like the, like every, so everyone's concerned about declining fertility, Koreans are not having, they're not marrying, they're not having kids anymore, despite all these nationalist and patriotic appeals. And so I also see this phenomenon in, in China, like the lying down movement, right? That, you know, we're not gonna, you know, we're kind of, this kind of anti-nationalist movement you know, very anti-nationalist, it's kind of pro-individualist. So again, I'm wondering what are the limits of this kind of nationalism? Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Han, I, you've not had a chance yet to respond to any of the questions and given given what Professor Lee was just saying about, um, about the importance of thinking about um, elites versus the general public and your presentation seemed to suggest there was a more general 
populist predisposition in uh, in Korea. Do you have any reflections on this question of how best to frame the emotion emotional dimension of this problem? Well, my feeling is that whether driving forces of the populism is related to nationalism, whether feminism or any kind of ideology, uh, this populist energy could be used in one way, you know, to produce more democratic participation. So in this sense, it may be positive element energy for democracy. But on the other hand, it could promote more hatred and antagonism, you know, uh, very much in negative sense. Then whatever energy we may have with us, this populist attitude or emotion turns out to be not rather constructive to democracy. And in the case of Korea, it has been very difficult to identify any political party as a positive a populist party, any politician either, you know. But this day, the Korean politics and uh, economy as well as society has been increasingly digitalized and therefore, this digital media express more emotion than political deliberation. And this politics is increasingly dominated by extra parliamentary social forces, which are very emotional, well organized, well mobilized. So therefore, the political politics seems to be much more fragile than before in terms of its sustainability and uh, resilience. You know. So this is kind of, you know, there's some, some kind of worrying aspect of digitalization of the culture and, uh, and, and the politics. And that is what we observe in Korea. So um, everybody is too much, you know, emotionally involved in uh, accusing the other part as a kind of evil uh, because of this politics determines almost everything, you know, in Korean reality. So um, that is my observation. So what should do in order to prevent that kind of a negative aspect of populism in order to facilitate the democracy? That is a kind of open question we have to confront. You know, that's my feeling. And maybe that that addresses your question, Joe, about um, I mean, which emotions are, are dominant here? In addition to anger, digitalization may be fueling a, a climate of general distrust, yeah. uh, so that adversaries on both sides of the the political divide simply don't believe what the other side is saying. Don't take it as credible. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, Meredith, I think, did you have anything you wanted to say coming in on any of the points we've just raised before I hand over to uh, Christo for a final few words? Oh, no, I think uh, Dr. Han and uh, Dr. Yi uh, have, have uh, covered it very well. Um, I would just add in the, on the point of gender, it, as some of you might be aware, there's a major, there's been a major backlash in South Korea in recent years about um, gender politics and the, you know, the, the gender uh, equal opportunity office, I forget what it's called. Um, in, in and there's sort of this this male rights uh, backlash that's very strong in South Korea right now. So um, if anything, it seems like the emotional impact of the, the you know the populist uh, emotions at play are, are kind of moving in in the opposite direction of of what a feminist society would hope for. But um, uh, that's just my my two cents. Okay. Um, well, there's, the program says that I should provide a quick summary of everything that we've covered. I'm not going to do that because that will simply delay the process. But I just want to thank um, all of our panelists for really fascinating discussions. I learned a great deal. Um, we've kept, we covered an enormous amount of terrain. Um, I hope there might be some way of bringing all of these points together in a way that would um, offer a, a research agenda for, for the future. But I'm sure our hosts will be thinking along those lines. So all that remains for me to do is to hand over to uh, Christo Pretorius for some final words. Thank you, Dave. Um, following on that coattails, absolutely. Thank you to everyone um, for your insightful presentations and for also the attendees uh, for coming along and enriching the panel with your questions and your remarks as well. Um, so to conclude then, uh, please mark your calendars for the next panel on the April 25th, 2024, 
Um, and remember to re register and join us for discussing populist authoritarianism in China, global and national, uh, national and global perspectives. And I hope you all have a great day uh, or a good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you.